Good morning. A very warm welcome to all of you joining us today. This webinar is the second in our Commonwealth Leadership Series. And for the first time, we have an all-female panel reflecting Rwanda's leadership in gender equality, with 60% of its parliamentarians being women and 50% of its cabinet, which is quite an achievement. CWEIC is the Commonwealth's business platform, and we are supporting our members and the wider Commonwealth family to create opportunities to trade with each other and for economic recovery post-COVID. This session will explore how Rwanda has emerged as a model of excellence in its pandemic response and look at how the Commonwealth's newest member is contributing to Africa's emergence as a global powerhouse in the post-pandemic global economic reset. We will also talk about Rwanda's vision for the Commonwealth Business Forum, now taking place in Kigali in 2021 with the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. We are delighted this morning to have participants from all over the Commonwealth. I believe we have around 300 people joining the webinar today. I'd now like to introduce our distinguished panel from the highest level of Rwanda's government to share their insights on the exciting opportunities Rwanda has to offer. We have Her Excellency Yamina Karatanye, Rwanda's High Commissioner to the UK. Yamina was appointed High Commissioner in December 2015. Prior to her posting in London, she was at the helm of the tourism and conservation portfolios at the Rwanda Development Board and also served as Rwanda's High Commissioner to Kenya. We have the Honourable Soraya Hakuziayame, Minister of Trade. Before her appointment as Minister of Trade and Industry, Soraya was Senior Vice President at ING Bank in London. She also served as Senior Advisor to Rwanda's Minister of Foreign Affairs and has worked in senior positions at BMP Paribas Group in Paris and the Bank of New York Mellon in Brussels. We have the Honourable Claire Akamanzi, CEO of the Rwanda Development Board. Claire has served as the Executive Director and CEO of the Rwanda Development Board since February 2017. The position is a cabinet level appointment by the President of Rwanda. In 2020, the World Health Organization announced that Claire was one of the founding board members of the WHO Foundation. Welcome, ladies. Before we start, I'd like to ask that those who have questions send them via the chat feature. And once the panelists have finished their discussion, we will address as many of your questions as possible. My first question this morning is to the High Commissioner. You mean that the government of Rwanda, led by President Kagame, has been praised by the international community for its highly effective COVID-19 preventative measures. The authorities mobilized the population in a decisive public health response. Governments are now deploying economic measures in an attempt to balance the protection of people's health with economic growth and safeguarding jobs. What lessons can other countries learn from Rwanda's governance structures, which have enabled it to respond so effectively to this crisis? Thank you, Sam, um, first uh, for, for the question, but also for hosting us uh, this morning. Um, through you, I also thank the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council um, for hosting us at a time when Rwanda is busy preparing to reopen its borders uh, post the pandemic. And um, so this is a timely conversation. Also, because we were um, originally to meet in Kigali last week for the CBF, um, um, which was to take place alongside the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. That, of course, had been, has been postponed, but it is only a postponement and we're looking at new dates for next year in 2021. So, um, of course, COVID uh, decided otherwise and uh, we are here um, joining in this conversation this morning. So, thank you. Um, on the specific to your question, I think few things come to mind uh, in terms of the government's response um, and the, the few successes we've registered. I think the first one is decisive leadership. It, it took 
a government that could respond quickly um, and act quickly in response to, to this pandemic. The second thing that comes to mind is the citizens' trust in the, in the government, because it takes two sides. It takes the government to issue guidelines and measures, and it takes on the other side a, a people that believes in the government. And um, I think that combination is um, uh, part and parcel of why we are succeeding in the fight against the pandemic. Also, and we will speak more to that, um, the use of drones. Um, so IT and innovation has been enhanced through this pandemic. Uh, we've seen drones that were uh, uh, used to, to send out uh, public health messages, as well as robots that have been used in hospitals and take um, uh, tasks that were uh, traditionally left for health workers, including temperature checks and the likes. I also wanted to mention that um, the multi-stakeholder approach to fighting the pandemic in Rwanda has been uh, a success. We've seen all sectors, all clusters come together and with efficiency deliver through uh, 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 the task at hand. And with that, we've seen uh, good successes. The local government structure in Rwanda, we have 30 districts, uh, 416 sectors, and then cells and villages. And through that structure, we see community health workers working in their communities. And I think that also has been um, a measure of success in seeing community health workers working in their own communities um, that also speaks to the trust that I mentioned um, earlier, and that has served us well. So many measures have, have um, uh, made Rwanda count as we speak today. Uh, last night's numbers, we have more recovered cases of COVID than active cases. Um, we have 610 who have healed, 581 active cases and unfortunately three deaths, but this is over a 12 plus million population. So we're not doing so bad. And like I said, we're uh, readying ourselves to reopen our, our economy. And so I hope the conversation this uh, morning with two of my favorite ladies will prove to you and demonstrate that uh, Rwanda is a country which responds uh, to crisis and opportunities in equal measures and we look forward to your contributions as well. Thank you. Thank you, High Commissioner. I'd now like to pose a question to the Minister of Trade. Rwanda was enjoying an economic boom prior to the pandemic, but no country has been immune to severe disruptions to trade and critical supply chain networks. How is your government mobilizing its economic resources across key sectors like exports, mining, tourism, investment, construction, and manufacturing to preserve Rwanda's development gains over the last two decades and to gradually revive the economy to its pre-pandemic state. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. I appreciate your invitation and I thank um, to echo uh, my colleague, uh, High Commissioner Yamina, the Commonwealth Enterprise Council for this webinar. Um, the uh, over the last decade, uh, we had we experienced as a country noticeable growth among the top uh, in Africa and globally, um, with uh, unprecedented unprecedented uh, growth levels, averaging seven to eight uh, percent for the last 15 years. Last year, our economic growth reached 9.4 percent, which was the highest we've had in a decade. And then, you know, the pandemic hit. Uh, Rwanda was uh, not uh, was also impacted, as all countries in the world. And considering really the sector contributions that we have, the activities that were restricted during the lockdown, um, uh, you know, represented almost 60% of total GDP. 
And even in the initial phase of easing the lockdown, which we started easing uh, early May, uh, we still had 50% of employees that were still restricted. However, through a constant dialogue between the government and the private sector, uh, we devised a social economic recovery plan to support the economy, uh, which was elaborated to offer key interventions across sectors uh, and, and not forgetting also a social protection program, uh, which was an, a relief response for the most vulnerable and affected households, um, which by providing social protection measures and food supply, but also um, having providing households with private assets grants and promoting labor intensive infrastructure projects as soon as we've lifted the lockdown that has sort of eased and mitigated the impact on our economy as far as uh, the business sector is, is concerned uh, we also put in place the economic recovery fund which is a two-year facility established by the government um, to cushion businesses affected by COVID-19 um, and this um, economic recovery fund uh, started uh, on, on, on a size of a 200 million dollars with government putting in 50 percent of the funds and then we're raising funds from development partners and other partners and to, so that we can allow um, the major sectors that have made the success of our economy, starting with tourism and hospitality, looking at manufacturing and looking also at, at uh, services and, and supporting our construction sector mainly. If I look at um, the tourism specifically, um, what we have done is one, uh, allowing uh, the, the economic recovery fund, 50% of it will go to actors in the tourism and hospitality industry. And second, of course, the cancellation of events um, uh, um, throughout, uh, you know, since March uh, to now uh, resulted in huge losses for our economy. But we have already announced reopenings of uh, tourism activities being domestic, but also for international travelers. Uh, commercial flights we resume, uh, you know, under the strict health measures uh, on the 1st of August this year. And domestic tourism is also being promoted so that we can um, start uh, restart the tourism activities, um, you know, but in line with, of course, the COVID-19 prevention measures. If I go back to the manufacturing sector, which had been uh, growing at, at um, an average of uh, 12 to 16 percent uh, last year the growth of manufacturing alone uh, was uh, 11 percent we've also provided um, facilities to actors in that uh, sector um, as well as supporting um, mainly the, the, our sectors of focus, agro-processing, uh, also industries in construction materials, and then uh, also promoting, um, you know, our garment industries through locally manufactured um, personal protective equipments. Uh, on top of that, our National Bank extended liquidity support to commercial banks um, with lending facilities um, of, of around uh, 50 billion rand and francs uh, offered to buy back bonds at prevailing market rate and also easing loan repayments conditions to borrowers which we think uh, you know really made made um, not only uh, reassured our private sector but also um, allowed them to sort of uh, weather the storm during the pandemic and now starts really the recovery process as we continue to support our private sector. Thank you very much, Soraya. Uh, I now have a question for Claire, CEO of the Rwanda Development Board. Rwanda is a leading East Africa hub for foreign investment and a gateway to the wider African continent. Other African countries look to you as pioneers of an impactful FDI agency. What are some of the opportunities that Rwanda offers for international Commonwealth investors seeking to set up in Africa, Claire? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Samantha, and thank you to the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council for this webinar. 
it's truly exciting to be able to uh, interact with many people uh, in the Commonwealth community from Rwanda, even with the pandemic of COVID-19 uh, sitting in Kigali. So we're very excited to be interacting with you today. So um, to your question, Samantha, what are the opportunities that we have for Commonwealth business people that are looking to interacting with Rwanda uh, for Chogam next year, but even beyond uh, as a business partnership? Uh, first of all, uh, Rwanda offers a very conducive business environment to entrepreneurs from all over the world. Today, we are ranked the second easiest place to do business in the world after Mauritius uh, on the African continent. We like to joke that if you look at only mainland Africa, we're actually the easiest place to do business. But if you look at mainland and outside the mainland Africa, we are, um, are the second easiest place to do business. So in terms of um, 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 opportunities that we have for investing in our country, I'd like to categorize them around three programs. The first program is Visit Rwanda. The second program is Made in Rwanda. And the third program is Start in Rwanda. And I'll elaborate on each of those. For Visit Rwanda, uh, we're promoting um, sectors that interact with our tourism sector and that bring people from outside Rwanda to come to Rwanda. I hope that uh, on this webinar, we do have some Arsenal uh, supporters and that you will have seen on some of the sleeves of Arsenal that we are calling upon you to visit Rwanda. And so to support that program of Visit Rwanda, the opportunities we have are for the hotel and hospitality sector, whether it's hotels for leisure around the national parks of the country and other tourist attractions, or whether it's um, coming to Rwanda for meetings, uh, hotels, business hotels, um, events. Uh, we just built a Kigali Arena where we are hosting uh, sports events. In fact, before COVID-19, we should have been hosting together with the NBA, the first basketball uh, African league in, in Rwanda because we have the facilities that we built for events. So from leisure tourism, to events in Rwanda, meetings in Rwanda, such as the Chogam that should have happened this year, but will happen next year. But also around Visit Rwanda, we are also attracting uh, people to visit Rwanda for medical reasons and wellness reasons. We are building capabilities in our health sector um, to be able to have access to good quality wellness and uh, medical facilities so that people can come to Rwanda, not only for meetings and not only for leisure, but also uh, for, uh, for medical tourism as well. And to do that, we are attracting investments in the whole chain in the medical sector, whether it's the expertise and the skills or um, hospitals, diagnostic capacity. We are really um, uh, prioritizing that level of investments and attracting businesses from all over the world uh, to come to Rwanda. So around visit uh, Rwanda, whether it's for leisure, for meetings, for events, building hotels, building lodges. And we do have um, a few lodges, in fact, Yesterday, um, one very popular travel magazine called Travel Asia uh, did uh, name one of Rwanda's uh, hotels called Bisate um, Lodge as one of the top 100 best hotels in the world. And so um, we're looking for more of those investments. We're looking for more of those partnerships to make Visit Rwanda even go to the next level. The second program that we have is Made in Rwanda. And as of uh, 2019, uh, Made in Rwanda, and that is really manufacturing, um, that sector contributed 17% to our GDP, and the minister did talk about uh, this sector and how we are also evolving the growth of this sector. But under Made in Rwanda, we are promoting uh, expertise and also capacity for production in Rwanda in those areas that one, we have the capacity, two, we have the potential to grow it, and three, we, have, we are very competitive um, in, in growing uh, those areas. And so I'll give examples of some of the subsectors we are growing under the theme of Made in Rwanda. One main one is construction materials, right from steel manufacturing to paint, making of paint or uh, making of granite, of marble, um, of uh, ceramics. We have a long list of construction materials that we are uh, promoting investment opportunities to make them in Rwanda and also for exports within the region. The second one is agro-processing. Uh, the food sector, the agriculture sector is very important. We're looking at uh, fruits and vegetables. We're looking at uh, cereals. Uh, we're also looking at beef processing, and we have opportunities in all these sectors, whether it's in partnership with local investors or completely greenfield investments. We have very attractive investments in the agriculture, agro-processing. And in particular, we have a flagship project called Gaviro uh, Agro Farm, which is um, uh, an irrigation a facility we're putting together with an Israeli company called Netofim. It's going to have uh, different phases, but up to 15,000 hectares of land. 
and we're looking for investments in these areas, whether it's fruits and vegetables, cereals, we're looking for large scale farming, but also processing of the products that come from those large uh, scale farms. And then the other one under Made in Rwanda is um, also pharmaceutical products. We are all, we've attracted a few uh, companies, one from um, Morocco uh, called Cooper Pharma, one from um, uh, Bangladesh called um, Apex, but we're looking for bigger um, pharmaceutical companies, the opportunities to make uh, some of those products in Rwanda, uh, from antibiotics to IV fluids, all those opportunities are there, and also really making uh, uh, drugs and other pharmaceutical products in the country. The other one is textiles and garments, uh, both for exports, but also for local uh, consumption. We are promoting whether it's fashion schools, design schools, or um, even cutting and sewing, um, as well as uh, developing some of the ecosystem around uh, the garment sector. We are developing a project uh, called the Garment City, where we are promoting um, an industrial park that is going to really be focusing on uh, producing textiles and garments, both for local, regional, and also global consumption. The last part that I want to talk about under Made in Rwanda is um, a light manufacturing of electronics, whether it's assembling of electronic products. And in line with this, our first um, investment that we attracted um, a few years ago was um, smartphone assembly. Today, we're able to make a Rwanda, Made in Rwanda uh, smartphone called Marathons. And we're hoping to make more um, electronic assembly, whether it's household uh, consumer goods, uh, to really make those uh, within the country, but also um, uh, to be able to export them outside. And also uh, automobile uh, assembling is a new area that we have also ventured in. Our first partnership was with uh, Volkswagen VW, where they are assembling uh, some of their cars in Rwanda. And also um, they started their first project in uh, mobility solutions uh, called MOVE um, again in the country. So those are, are the key sectors and examples of the, the opportunities or investments that we're looking for um, partnerships um, under the Made in Rwanda theme. So um, in addition to Visit Rwanda, uh, Made in Rwanda, the last big component I want to talk about is Start in Rwanda. And what that really means is um, a positioning that we are uh, developing in Rwanda, which is to become a hub uh, for the rest of the African continent. And what we're telling investors is come to Rwanda with your, a concept. If you have an innovation, uh, a proof of concept that you want to establish, come to Rwanda, we will work with you to establish the conditions for proving that concept. And once successful, we will work with you to export that to the rest of the continent. And this is not just an idea. We actually have worked with a few companies to do this. I'd like to give you two examples. One is um, a company called Zipline that made the first commercial drones in the world. Uh, we worked with them to prove the concept of a commercial drone delivering uh, medical supplies in particular blood, especially in remote areas where you don't have the infrastructure for emergency delivery of our products. So we worked with them. There, there, there were no regulations on drones in Rwanda. We had not done that. We had not done that before, but we worked with them. We developed the regulations. We understood and learned together with them. And by the end of it all, they were able to successfully launch uh, commercial drones for blood delivery in Rwanda. And today they are doing that in Ghana and they are also expanding to other African, African countries. The second example I want to give you is a British company that many of you might know called Babylon. Babylon is um, a company that provides uh, digital consultations and um, uh, treatment online using a chat box feature that they've built on phones. And uh, they did that in the UK. So it was already a successful uh, concept that was established in, in the UK. But then they had not been able to do that outside a developed country in a developing country setting. So we worked with them also to translate that success in a developed country um, in the, like the UK to also customize that for services that are specific for a developing country like Rwanda. And again, uh, from here, they're looking at expanding to Kenya. I know they're currently negotiating with Kenya. And again, the idea is expand to the rest of the African continent in order to uh, prove your concept and, and scale up. And to support that, we have to build infrastructure in Rwanda. So the rest of the opportunities we're promoting is the infrastructure that will enable this start in Rwanda concept. And that comes, you know, brings opportunities in, in, in energy in production because this is a cross-cutting need. Kigali Innovation City is an industrial park for innovation. We are building a new airport of Jesaram. All this infrastructure is the, you know, the base and underlying uh, um, investments we are making and attracting even more investments to enable all these visit Rwanda, made in Rwanda and such in Rwanda concepts to work. Thank you, Samantha.
Thank you, Claire. That's incredibly impressive. And uh, I'll definitely be booking my ticket to visit Rwanda. It sounds wonderful. Uh, I think if we go over to Soraya, uh, Trade Minister, Africa is home to the world's fastest growing labour force. And while the economy was impacted by the crisis, it has also been an opportunity for entrepreneurs, which Claire has just referred to, uh, from your efforts to produce PPE locally uh, to the Mara phone, which we've spoken about, all the signs are there for Africa to find its path to industrialization. How will the Continental Free Trade Agreement boost internal consumption and intra-Africa trade? Um, thank you, Samantha. I, the, um, the Continental Free Trade Agreement, which was signed in Kigali in 2018, uh, is really a game changer for our continent. For long, our continent has augmented markets and, and, and a lack of integration. Uh, but since then, um, you know, the, all the countries four countries uh, on our continent decided to put this single market in place. And uh, the current estimates put intra-African trade at a level of 17%, which is really low uh, compared to the 68% we have in Europe or 59% we have in Asia. However, by um, starting this continental free trade area, what uh, this means is more trade uh, within African countries um, and, and uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa estimates that by 2022 uh, we would increase intra-African trade uh, by 52 percent um, and imports from outside the continent would decrease by 10 billion per year, 10 billion dollars per year whereas our agricultural industrial exports would increase by 7% uh, each year. This uh, provides enormous opportunities for um, entrepreneurs, uh, not only in Rwanda, but Africa in general, but also investors who decide to invest uh, in Rwanda to be able to tap into uh, that large 1.3 billion people market. And uh, by really removing, uh, you know, non-tariff barriers and, and uh, you know, having trade facilitation measures uh, to push the speed and reduce the cost of trading within the continent, this is really what uh, will drive um, uh, will drive the, the, the growth on our continent. As far as Rwanda is concerned, uh, what we have already started um, investing in, being in, in uh, manufacturing to be able to offer um, you know uh, manufactured products not only to the continent uh, but also you know improving uh, trade related infrastructure reduce procedure, procedural bottlenecks to trade facilitation initiatives that will allow us to not only increase our exports uh, to the continent which um, in spite of, of, of COVID-19, we've really, if we look at our export to the EU and UK, we continued through cargo um, flights to, to, to the Europe and, 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 and the UK uh, through Rwanda to really um, continue exporting, especially horticultural products um, and uh, coffee and tea uh, to, to European markets and the UK market in particular. Of course, we cannot shy away from, from the challenges that the continent has, uh, and especially the impact of COVID-19 on our economies. Um, the contraction of, of, of sub-Saharan Africa economies uh, is estimated to be between $35 billion uh, to $100 billion due to an output decline and a steep fall in commodity prices, uh, especially um, for, for countries that rely mostly on export of commodities. Um, however, uh, the, the fact that we've realized, especially through COVID-19, that having um, integrated region and, and working with our partners in the region to not only facilitate the movement of goods, uh, facilitate trade, um, even when countries were under lockdown, has given us um, a, a reason to, 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 to fast track um, what the CFTA really means, the continental free trade area, meaning uh, having integration of, 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 of value chains across the continent, but also 
this provides an opportunity for African countries uh, to address some of the challenges that have hindered uh, our, our trade. Um, Claire has talked about, you know, having um, increasing local manufacturing and promoting made in Rwanda products, um, attracting um, you know, international companies in our country and giving them the platform to reach uh, the, the African markets. Marathons is one example, Volkswagen um, assembly plant uh, is a second uh, example. And we think, um, you know, um, moving forward, uh, all the opportunities that not only the continental free trade area um, is giving us as a country um, and, and also um, attracting more FDIs um, into into our country and and serving a larger market um, than um, than Rwanda itself is something that we're hoping that more investors will tap into. Um, if I give examples on on you know how um, African economies had grown uh, pre COVID nineteen, uh, the average annual GDP growth had outperformed the global average, and six of the world's ten fastest growing economies are still in Africa. So this implies massive potential for increased production and also mm. um, a, a platform for, for, um, for growth on the, on the long haul um, as we also uh, start trading under a single market which uh, will start uh, on the 1st of uh, January 2021. So um, I'm, I'm really calling on, on all, all investors um, uh, to, to, to really uh, tap into that opportunity um, and, and also the um, advantage that it gives um, an investor, a company uh, setting shop in Rwanda to be able to tap into the larger uh, continental market going forward. Thank you, Soraya. Uh, as we know, uh, Rwanda has always had very uh, comprehensive plans for and visions for its future. You have Vision 2020 and you have your Vision 2050 goals. Uh, obviously, with every crisis, there is opportunity and you've outlined many of those opportunities. But if I could just go to you, Claire, could you describe in practice how you think this pandemic may enable you to fast track some of those goals, even perhaps in your 2050 uh, vision statement? Uh, uh, thank you, Samantha. Um, again, as you said, our leadership mindset is to never waste a crisis. Uh, we do know that crises do happen, and we know that challenges do happen, but our leadership mindset, right from our president, has always been fine. How, what do we learn from that crisis? How do we make sure that we build the capabilities to fight that crisis or a similar crisis in the future. And if you look at the history of Rwanda since 1994 genocide against the Tutsis, it's really been uh, making choices that will not remain in the past and will not remain in the challenges of the past, but really forging an even better future with the strength and motivation of the lessons learned uh, from, our, from our crisis. So that is really our leadership um, um, mindset. And uh, more practically, as we uh, learn from the uh, pandemic of COVID-19, I think the three lessons that we, we see uh, as we draw lessons for the future, and one of them is that adaptability is extremely important as we think about the future post-COVID-19. And we've seen adaptability of uh, our plans. We had a Vision 2050 plan, Vision 2020, and then this pandemic that nobody planned for uh, comes and takes over everything, takes over our lives, takes over our budgets, takes over our social life, takes over everything. And adapting to this new uh, crisis, but also trying to create value uh, in spite of the crisis. So we've seen our, not just the government, but also the business sector adapt. Uh, companies that used to make textiles and garments and are not able to do that so started to make masks. And now we have um, many masks, enough for the whole country uh, for people to wear masks. And these are made in Rwanda barrier masks on the continent. And then we also had people that had to make masks, uh, surgical masks, and had to quickly adapt to getting equipment from China, for example, that they didn't have before, and starting to make those um, masks in Rwanda. We have companies like FabLab that started to use 3D printing to make um, face, uh, face shields. Again, we're not making those in Rwanda. So the ability to adapt to the new normal, the new world, the new needs, the new uh, requirements, and being able to uh, adapt very quickly was very important. 
we saw restaurants adapt from being uh, sit-in restaurants because we were in lockdown a lot of the time to being delivery uh, companies. They, they started to make food and deliver it to people's homes. We had motorbikes, uh, for example, that were used to taking passengers. If you've been to Kigali, you've seen that a very common um, and, and cost-effective way of moving around is on a motorbike that you hire as a taxi. These motorbikes were, couldn't, couldn't operate because people were in their homes for lockdown, but they became delivery companies. They organized themselves and started delivering food, uh, delivering uh, different products to people's homes. So they really, that level of adaptability was very important, and we see that as um, a huge part of the post-COVID-19 world uh, for us to attain the goals that we had in 2020, 2015, in order to see new, level, new ways of creating value. The second lesson that was very important for us was agility. The, uh, the ability to move quickly to make decisions because the, the pandemic didn't give us time to prepare for anything. You had to move and move very quickly. And a, a good example I like to give is um, uh, when companies wanted to make, uh, for example, you know, um, the, 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 the surgical masks or to make the coveralls. We have one company in Rwanda that's making coveralls, the PPP um, uh, equipment, and they had to get the equipment from China. And if we were to use the normal delivery chain with all the disruptions that were them, they would not be able to make those on time to save lives. And so government, uh, our Rwanda um, national carrier had to move very quickly to get a special authorization to, from the government of China and go and quickly pick the equipment and bring it to, to Rwanda. So that level of uh, very quick uh, solutions, very quick um, uh, decisiveness, and I think um, Ambassador Amina did talk about that at the beginning, was extremely important. And also to quickly move from being used to using cash and increasing the cashless transactions our financial sector also moved very quickly to make it really affordable, both in terms of policies, in terms of um, uh, costs of making transactions um, online. Within the first month of the lockdown, our cashless transactions had grown three times. And again, that was really the ability to create the conditions to enable that very, very quickly. So agility, adaptability, very important. But the last part that I want to talk about in um, answering your question, Samantha, is resilience. As we you know, move quickly, as we adapt, we have to think about building resilient economies, building um, the business sector that is really resilient in the future. And for us, that long-term resilience uh, starts now. And we have identified three flagship programs, projects that we think will help to build that resilience, especially when it comes to building Rwanda's foreign exchange um, uh, reserves, which was really one of the biggest challenges we had when disruptions of tourism and disruptions of exports happen. So those three projects are the, the, the airport. I did talk about the Bujisara airport at the beginning, but it's a $1.3 billion investment that we are only starting now. The idea is to build um, a very big capacity to be able to um, not only create jobs, not only create uh, opportunities for prosperity in exports, but also really promote uh, the future uh, of, of Rwanda's tourism sector and also interactions with the world. The second one is the Kigali Innovation City. I did talk about that as well. This is a city within the special economic zone of Rwanda that is going to be focusing on promoting international global firms for IT and innovation. It's going to promote on, it's, it's going to focus on promoting uh, innovative young um, entrepreneurs who have innovations and ideas and all they need is um, venture capital, interactions with global big companies that can buy the ideas, but creating one ecosystem, one physical place where um, from the financial sector um, to the um, capacity build, training and capacity building sector and also to IT firms interacting together to make a sort of Silicon Valley, if you like, uh, of Rwanda. The last one is um, the Kigali International Financial Center. And we are um, very much looking forward to launching this with Chogam, actually, because we know that the, the, the UK um, and also other Commonwealth countries uh, have capacity and have ex expertise and experience in the financial services. And so we are also launching the Kigali International Financial Center. We have the legal framework, the tax framework, all in advanced stages, and we believe these opportunities are going to be very instrumental in building a more resilient Rwanda. Thank, thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Claire. And we're going to refer to the Financial Centre a little bit later. We have Graham Rigby on the line. Uh, I think we'll just take one more question from um, Yamina, and then we have a lot of questions coming in from our panel, and I think there'll be a lot of value in taking those questions 
So, uh, Yamina, just to uh, finish the formal session, I think the great lockdown, everyone agrees, has driven people and business to reassess their priorities. And I think there is now a new global appreciation for the environment. Um, everyone is talking about this global reset and a, a reflection and a realignment of values. So Rwanda has shown leadership in this area for a long time. How, do you, how can this be reflected in Rwanda's vision at home and internationally as incoming chair and officer of the Commonwealth? Thank you, Samantha. Um, well, Rwanda's vision, both Vision 2020 and Vision 2050, um, very much follow a green growth strategy. Um, and uh, just an example, uh, uh, in May this year, Rwanda was the first country in Africa to submit its enhanced nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. And we did this uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, so, so just to emphasize that um, we, we have not lost track of uh, our environmental um, objectives, um, even, even when we're dealing with a crisis. And of course, these uh, nationally determined contributions focus both on mitigation and adaptation and, uh, you know, just aligning it with uh, our economic growth as described by both uh, Soraya and Claire. Um, so very much um, in tune with um, environmentally um, um, sustainable um, growth. And we hope to, to be able to link this to the sustainable development goals um, of 2030. As you know, um, that those are the objectives um, through the UN. And what Rwanda hopes to do through um, its chair and office, um, and uh, as, as, uh, as we host Chogum, is to very much align the environment theme as central to the other themes. And the concept paper that we propose to um, other member states, which was very well received, speaks very much to the centrality of environment uh, with other cross-cutting teams. So we have trade, youth, um, ICT and innovation as an enabler, as well as the rule of law and governance to, to support uh, green growth. And what we hope to do um, as, as we chair the Commonwealth is to share what we've learned, uh, to share what we've done, and learn from others as we continue developing a green growth global strategy. And we hope that we can all succeed together. Thank you. Thank you, Yamina. Before we move on to the q and I'd like to invite one of our members, Graham Wrigley, who is the chairman of CDC Group, to give a brief overview of some of their recent work in Rwanda. CDC is the largest private equity investor in Africa and last month signed an MOU with Rwanda Finance for the development of the Kigali International Financial Centre. Graham. Hi, uh, thank you Sam and it's great to be uh, seeing this uh, all-female panel and everything with Rwanda is always so exciting. Babylon, Metafin, Venture Capital, um, it's great. So. Um, uh, I'll be brief, but I, I was, uh, you know, at, at the hugely successful uh, African Investment Summit last year, and actually at a Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council event, I had the honour of sitting next to President Kugami, and we started talking about um, um, his plans to develop uh, Kigali as an international financial centre. Um, and you know, some of the best ideas and decisions. Um, are made outside of meeting rooms, and some people say that Aaron Sorkin wrote a few good men on a, on a, on a, on a napkin. And actually, we started talking about how CDC could help in this vision. Um, and over the last few months, uh, the team at CDC, led by Mark Kendrick and Davis, I think is on this call, have worked with the team at um, Rwanda, Rwanda Finance to come up with this thing we were going to announce at Chogham in Kigali. So we're sorry we can do it then, but it was uh, uh, you know, it's great to talk about it now. Now, why do we get involved? The first one is expertise. CDC has been, since the 1990s, the biggest single fund investor in African uh, private equity. Uh, so we have a huge amount of experience and knowledge of the laws and regulations 
um, to do this. Um, we actually started in 2015 working with FSDA Africa, another part of the uh, UK government's international uh, development efforts, and Impia to look to how we could create an onshore financial centre uh, in, in Africa. Um, um, we're very keen to bring all our practical support um, about what it will take to develop Kigali to be you know, an international financial centre of choice. And we see the, you know, the particular you know, unique advantage of the UK being in the city of London as a gateway to future capital flows. And, um, you know, and I think increasingly not only is there um, a greater recognition of the importance of, achieve, of cap private capital achieving the SDGs, but obviously the, the, the huge economic um, implications of COVID will reinforce that as the reality of the things we've been talking about in the moment uh, could play out in the next few years. So we want, in, we see this initiative as part of a long-term investment uh, of partnership by CDC to help the, when we build back better post COVID, we're bringing in, you know, world-class standards of transparency, governance, uh, deep embedding of uh, ESG, and even beyond the ESG impact principles. So we really hope that together we can help make Kigali a gateway for more and more capital coming into the continent of Africa, which uh, you know it needs and will be you know great opportunity for both the continent and international investors. So thank you very much, Sam. But we're delighted to be members. You know you help make these connections happen, and uh, please give my regards to President Kigali. I let him know that things happened. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Graham. That's a very, very exciting development. I think now we'll bring the formal session to a close. We have lots of questions coming in uh, to our panel. So I think we'll take the first question, which is from uh, Joe Lomas, the UK High Commissioner. Uh, Joe says the UK is very much looking forward to Chogham 2021. What changes, if any, does Rwanda expect to make to Chogham? 21, given the COVID impact. Claire, do you want to take that question? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Samantha. Um, actually, for the Commonwealth Business Forum, uh, we are adapting to the reality that uh, COVID-19 has uh, brought to us. And so if you look at uh, our goals for uh, CBF 2021, uh, we're looking at uh, what uh, the, the CBF can contribute to setting the agenda for a new global order because we believe that COVID-19 is going to be uh, creating a new global order and we hope that CBF 2021 can be uh, one of the first big gatherings that can actually really um, uh, lead in setting the agenda for, for this new global order. We are also looking at um, uh, pragmatic outcomes. Uh, how do we create prosper prosperity, jobs, opportunities for the people of Commonwealth uh, with all the disruptions that the COVID-19 has uh, created, as well as um, making sure that the Commonwealth remains uh, uh, or emerges as a leader in trade, investments, and businesses in this new global dispensation. Um, and again, with Rwanda being a chair for the two years uh, after Chogam, we believe that this is going to be um, a very strong role that Rwanda will play in its role as a chair. But also, more specifically, uh, the CBF 2021, we're looking at five overall themes, very much taking into consideration this whole new impact of COVID-19. And I'll just quickly go through them. The first one is rethinking globalization of supply chains. I think we all have seen from COVID-19's impact that um, value, uh, supply chains have been disrupted. And so we want to you know, focus on a, a discussion and reflection on how we rethink the new globalization of supply chains. And the second also, how can businesses become a force for good? We want to very much look at how businesses can be uh, and be, be not just inclusive, but also responsive to the needs of society. And also how businesses can really be seen more as uh, that force for good. The third one is a healthy and resilient Commonwealth. I think when we're talking about COVID-19, where the health sector cannot be left behind. And so thinking about how uh, the CBF Business Forum 2021 can also really tackle this issue of a healthy and resilient Commonwealth. The fourth one is the future of work. I think the future of work, um, the way we were thinking about it before COVID-19 and the way we're thinking about it today is, is not the same. And so making sure that also it's a very uh, pertinent theme that we'll be talking about how COVID-19 has changed the way we think about work 
and how the future of work looks like. And the last one is how do we build a resilient and sustainable commonwealth? So these five themes have been very carefully thought and adapted to take into the realities of this new normal that COVID-19 is, um, is bringing. So this, that's how we are, we are responding to that. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Uh, we now have a question from Lord Popper, the UK's Prime Minister's trade envoy to Rwanda. Uh, I think, Soraya, if I could ask you to take this question, what progress has Rwanda Air had in securing slots at Heathrow Airport for the London Kigali London route, something which the panel and I have been working hard to facilitate? Uh, thank you, Sam, and, and thank you, Lord Popat. I know he's been working hard to really have one run their first flight to, 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 to the European continent, to the UK through Gatwick um, happened. That was uh, uh, in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. And now um, there's also, we've been uh, looking at how uh, those flights could actually depart and land to Hebrew. And uh, we've been facilitated actually on some of the repatriation flights that uh, were able to depart from Heathrow. Same for our cargo flights, which were really um, helpful in assisting our exporters, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to be able to continue to supply the UK market um, through those cargo flights. So, um, and I think if I go back to really uh, what our national airline has has uh, has brought in in linking us uh, to the world, not only from a business point of view, but also attracting tourists to our to our country. Um, and and uh, for for uh, as as we speak, we we have now 25 destinations uh, that are served, but by run there. And, and, and we've seen an increase not only on passengers, but the fact that, uh, you know, uh, passengers from across the, the continent can also transit to Kigali to take their flights, uh, be it to, to, to the UK, to, to, um, to, to Israel, to China, um, and, and we are starting a new flight to New York. So that uh, we set really a precedence to have that uh, uh, render flight to, to Gatwick, which is something that uh, most people didn't think would would come as as, uh, as fast as as we've did uh, that expansion. Thank you. We have another question for you. I think here from the uh, chairman of the Commonwealth Insurance Forum, Francis de Zilueta. What areas of insurance are of most interest in Rwanda and Africa? Uh, and of course, other developing nations, including training, education, microinsurance, sustainability, infrastructure, and so on, and what actions might be suggested? Uh, thank you, Sam. This is a really great question as, as insurance is still a nascent uh, sector, uh, not only in our country, uh, but also um, in, on the continent as a whole. Um, so far, really the uh, non-life insurance uh, has been, has been uh, really the, the key, I would say, products that are being offered. Uh, but what we're looking for is, is really uh, more investments and more operators um, in, in, in life insurance, uh, pension insurance and health insurance. And this, I think, are the areas where you have a lot of opportunities um, and in, uh, in, 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 uh, not only in Rwanda in particular, and also offering more sophisticated, I would say, products. Um, which go with, with growing economies or developing economies to sort of offer a whole array of, of, of insurance products, uh, not only for, for the personal insurance, but also corporate insurance uh, and in group insurance that we see now our companies are, are, are really looking for. Thank you, Soraya. Uh, I have a question from CWEIC Chairman Lord Marland. Uh, what is the basis of the rule of commercial law and the enforcement process international businesses would be able to rely on when investing in Rwanda? Claire, do you want to take that question? Uh, thank you very much, Samantha. Um, so Rwanda's uh, national legal system is a hybrid of uh, the common, uh, common law as well as um, the civil law. And so our laws in Rwanda are very much reflective of international norms. And we did look at countries like the UK and New Zealand when we develop most of our commercial laws. But when it comes to enforcement, um, we usually go for international arbitration 
and we are members of um, the UN uh, ICSID, we are members of the International Court of Justice, we are members of many uh, ANSI trials, for example, and so we also um, accept arbitration, international arbitration, when investors come to Rwanda and they want us to uh, check that truth, we've, we agreed uh, to do that because we're members of many of these international arbitration systems. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. We have a question to the Trade Minister from Alex Rakundo from the Once Acre Fund. The pandemic has hit our economy hard and agriculture is a part of our recovery plan. What are the efforts that are being invested in agriculture, particularly so that we prevent food insecurity in the aftermath of this pandemic? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, actually, on all those sectors that were less hit by COVID, agriculture was one of them. Um, uh, and and uh, the, the fact that most of our food is sourced locally, so we did not um, suffer so much as far as production uh, is, 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 is concerned. However, um, it's true that in the agriculture value chain, um, there are, uh, you know, um, be it on, on, on imports of fertilizers, for instance, where we had uh, one, we managed to make sure that we facilitate the supply of those fertilizers to farmers. And second, looking also at the markets and, and, and on the other side of, of the agriculture chain uh, for our farmers, how do we make sure that we can uh, still um, uh, still guarantee markets, be it domestic markets, but also export markets. There's been decline, of course, on our traditional exports, although they continued. Uh, um, obviously, a lot of delays on, on all exports uh, that were going through uh, through roads. However, on the uh, recovery fund, where um, uh, agro processing uh, factories are also catered for, uh, we've made sure that uh, the government uh, increases its budgets and its support to our agriculture um, sector to make sure that uh, we don't face any food security issue. And as we've seen, this uh, fiscal year's budget also catered more for agriculture uh, so that we can sustain uh, production that we've seen uh, in the last couple of years. Thank you, Soraya. We probably have time for two more questions. We have uh, many questions coming through, which is always a good sign. And we will take these questions after the session and uh, give you feedback from the ministers if we don't have time to cover them today. Uh, but we have a question here from Luke Rogers, the Rwanda Operations Manager of TechMet Limited. The mining sector accounts for around 15% of Rwandan export. And I currently oversee the largest mining company in Rwanda, where we are planning the acquisition of the second largest mining company, which will constitute the largest private sector deal in the history of the Rwandan mining sector. My question to the panel is, what is the Rwandan government's plan to support the mining industry as it recovers from the COVID crisis, both for the small scale local miners and large scale deals such as ours? Who would like to take that question, Soraya? Thank you. Um, indeed, mining is one of our uh, strategic sectors and especially a contributor to our exports. Um, and through the Rwanda Mining Board, uh, what support we have uh, uh, given so far is one, uh, making sure that uh, we sort of streamline the sectors uh, where we had a lot of traditional uh, mining um, make sure that we can have investments in that sector to modernize it, um, have mergers, and I, and I think um, uh, the question uh, was asked by someone working on, on merging, um, you know, mining operators so that we can scale up, um, we can scale up uh, quickly um, uh, that, that sector. Um, one of the uh, support that we've given is government set up, setting up an export growth fund uh, for our exporting company. At the beginning of it, mining had been excluded as a beneficiary to that fund, but since last year, we've opened it up to, to the mining sector as well, uh, because we, we realize it's a, a strategic sector, as I mentioned. And I think, um, you know, although 
um, export of, of, of mining exports has, has also been hit uh, by COVID-19. We believe that uh, through that export growth fund plus the recovery fund that's also, um, that also mining companies are eligible to, we can uh, continue supporting the growth of that sector. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Soraya. That's a very comprehensive answer. I'm afraid that's all we'll have time for today. But as I say, we will follow up on your questions because we have so many good questions coming through. And I think that reflects the level of interest in what Rwanda is doing and the exciting opportunities that lay ahead. Uh, thank you, too, for giving us all a much uh, more detailed insight into what's going to be happening at CBF uh, next year in Kigali. It's very exciting. Uh, thank you to Francis who, who uh, answered, asked that very good insurance question. We are going to have an insurance session at CBF for the first time, we hope, which is um, also a, a wonderful development. So I'd just like to thank all of our panellists for joining us today. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank the High Commissioner Yamina for all your support in London and for everything you're doing uh, to support us as the uh, co-hosts, our partners of CBF. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you in Kigali next year. I think with that uh, brilliant promotion by Claire, how can you resist? It sounds absolutely wonderful. And you sound very well prepared as well. Uh, thank you so much. This is uh, just one of our series of webinars for all our members and our wider network. Uh, we welcome you all. Next week on Tuesday, we have a focus on Nigeria webinar with the Vice President of Nigeria. And the team have circulated invitations, but do get in touch if you'd like to join. And once again, uh, thank you for joining our first all-female panel. Uh, I think uh, it was a very good one. And uh, I look forward to working with you over the coming year. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just me.